America, the mid-20th century. Bookstores filled with novels, histories, and poetry. Libraries that loan literature out for free and provide silent retreat for readers. But these places aren't for everyone. In a still segregated country, one young girl struggles to get her hands on anything to read. But one Christmas, she'll receive a book that will change her life and define her future. How can one book change the way you see the world? And how did reading offer one future poet the escape she so desperately needed? Find out. Read Jabberwocky Baby by Wanda Coleman. My writing, life, and loves. As journalist, poet, writer, and occasional script writer, I find that one of the most difficult of my writerly tasks is deciding what becomes what. At some point during the writing, it may become how much of what becomes the article, the essay, the poem, or the story. In my case, the lines between fact and fiction are irriscably drawn, and I draw them painfully with my editorial eye focused on a stringent and authentic rendering. My candid appraisals and observations in my fact pieces are usually not intended as insults, even if they may be taken as such by those on whom I focus, like Wallace Stegner, Fire and Ice. I am in the universal tradition of writers who concern themselves with the truth. Never mind that it is apt to hurt someone in some way, most likely me. But allegiance to the truth need not preclude an impish sense of humor and the satirical or romance with the surreal. Once I've decided on the what, all my vision and efforts are turned on the how. The actual writing then becomes a challenge, a chore, or a joy, depending on the circumstances governing my emotions at the time. What's shaking among those with whom I live in Southern California? Once the decision is made, the issue of tone arises, or the way I express my what. One of the banes of Black authors in the Western United States is our being too frequently left out of the larger cultural dialogues, particularly those on race. When I speak out, it is never to further the provincial, but always to seek balance and inclusion. Speaking out too loudly may net us further isolation. When our voices are heard, it is testimony to our fortitude, genius, and persistence, and for many, our willingness to travel east, if not relocate there. In the introduction to the African-American West, a century of short stories, University Press of Colorado, 2000. An anthology in which I appear, editors Bruce Glassred and Lori Champion aptly summarize the problem. Because historically black Americans were denied publication in white journals, because American publishers frequently assumed an Eastern bias, because Western African American publishers were too busy exploring opportunities for survival, because Western writers were less likely to use condescending dialect to depict stereotypes. Blacks in the West have too often been neglected. These words are true to my experience. The editors go on to define breaking with tradition and to explore why Western writers, black and white, are frequently in the literary forefront. And again, they seem to be on to something. In the late 1980s, I began to hear the word experimental associated with my work. I had always thought of myself as certainly aspiring to go beyond the conventional. Had I succeeded beyond my expectations or was I being misread, vice vice the quote above? Both. Experimentation was a notion. I had embraced in my youthful readings as I absorbed the existentialist particularly the French, I thought I had abandoned it as I matured, 
Consciously, I no longer cared what I was avant-garde or not. I wanted to be read, not gather dust on a bookshelf. But the harder I wrote, the more others seemed to cast me outside the mainstream of African-American writers, outside the outside, as one critical observer put it. Yet, some of my regional co cohorts regard me as predominant, if not completely establishment. What has come about then is my apparent psychosocial ma'afa, my literary middle passage as disjuncture, as I am ever caught between aesthetic devils and deep blue issues. When reflecting on that part of my psyche claim by journalism, I am dismayed by how frequently I have been invited to write about the Watts and South Central riots, yet how seldom I've been asked to discuss in any real depth other facets of the African-American experience in Southern California. The riots may seem to be my obsession, but they are not. Los Angeles, however, is an unending source of material for my writings. It is a terrain with which I'm fascinated the birthplace I've yet to abandon. With the aim of showing my Los, Los Angeles whole, I reprint here a couple of interviews and a Q&A, with corrections made where I was heard incorrectly or comments added to passages where my opinions have changed or been better expressed in my passing in passing years. Seating to current media jargon, I have frequently defied geography using the post-riot names of specific areas of LA that conveniently define its entire African-American populace. Watts, including Pacoima, 31 miles away in the East San Fernando Valley, and Riverside, 58 miles east, likewise South Central, including the southern tip of the city proper, Hyde Park, Inglewood, Jefferson Park, and Watts Willowbrook, despite the steady displacement of Blacks by immigrants of color. While born in Watts, I was technically raised not in South Central, but in Los Angeles, albeit the Southern Inn, a white enclave where mine was the first black family. My Los Angeles is that city whose boundaries were once rigidly enforced by the Los Angeles Unified School District, a volatile turf ruled by five senior high schools, John C. Fremont, David Starr Jordan, Thomas Jefferson, Manual Arts, and George Washington. It is literally and metaphorically that city which would explode into world headlines twice before the end of the 20th century. The riot inside me, then, is the continuation of the non-fictional directions I briefly discuss in my introduction to Native in a Strange Land, Trials and Tremors. The first two sections here collect recent essays, interviews, and visitations that encompass my stylistic extremes, from softer moments, as in the open letter to my father, to an encounter with Dr. Roberta Seitz, the Australian author activist, to primal orb density, in which actual newspaper headlines, snippets from city desk reports, and mock quiz underscore my rages. Walking the same ground, I repeatedly meet myself as I hopscotch the decades, skate along relationships, and throw stones into the darkness. The third section opens with the most controversial text I've ever written. My review of Maya Angelou's A Song Flung Up to Heaven, published in the Los Angeles Times book review on April 14, 2002. Following it are my subsequent articles examining the fallout and so far as I've been able to assess it. Remarkably, the single book review has made an infamous for far longer than Warhol's 15 minutes and even now, two years later, the trouble has not quite gone away. To these articles, I've added a slightly reflective postscript. There's no such beast as objectivity in this jungle. Hollywood was the revolution is one of my favorite lines. I use it in one of the 100 jazz poems collectively call, called the American Sonnets. Sonnets. In that poem, my Hollywood is simultaneously the topography of Southern California and its impact on world culture from Disneyland to McDonald's. This sentiment is echoed in the final part of Riot, 
as I returned to literal and literary Los Angeles with the playful and bemused spirit that initially inspired this collection. Some of these pieces overlap with our com complement, those in native in a strange, strange land, particularly Dancer on a Blade, which contains the kind of poetic passages that characterize that book. I was a stand-in diva for June Jordan. Letters to E. Ethelbert Miller and Wearing My Maturity illuminate my darkly humorous aspect. Five years after, 9-11 blues, and the riot inside me find me back on familiar turf. The implications reaching further and reverberating globally, I hope. Jabberwocky Baby. The stultifying intellectual loneliness of my 1950s and 60s upbringing was dictated by my looks. Dark skin and unconquerable kinky hair. Boys gawked at me and girls tittered behind my back. Black teachers shook their heads in pity, and white teachers stared in amusement or in wonder. I found this rejection unbearable and encouraged by my parents to read, sought an escape in books, which were usually hard to come by. There were no colored-owned bookstores in our neighborhood. The libraries discour discouraged Negro readers. My reading appetite had no limits. At six or seven, I was slogging through Papa's dual issues of National Geographic and Mama's tepid copies of Reader's Digest and her favorite murder mysteries. At age 10, I consumed the household copy of complete works of Shakespeare. And while the violence was striking in Hamlet engrossing, particularly Ophelia, I was too immature to fully appreciate the bard until frequent rereadings during my mid-teens. In high school, I would read Plato's dialogues, Aristotle's metaphysics, Machiavelli's The Prince, and Alexander Pope. And my teachers would complain to my parents that I was reading the wrong kind of literature, that my little learning was a dangerous thing. White people laughed at things that were not funny. Distances were deceptive and maps untrustworthy. My parents were constantly getting lost and were frightened of asking the police or firemen for assistance. Those same authorities, white teachers said, were friendly and there to protect and serve us. Smiling white adults were instantly and incomprehensibly nasty to us the moment our parents were not around. Waiters, waitresses, and drive-in car hops were hostile, always got our orders wrong, served our food cold, and made us wait until they had attended to everyone else beforehand. Store clerks refused to take our money unless we laid it flat on the counter and would not give us change unless we asked for the correct amount first. White doctors and nurses would never touch us with their bare hands and seldom with gloves on. White ministers smiled while calling us heathens and pickaninnies. Black and Mexican children were chastised or ignored for behavior that earned white children recognition and praise. All white people lied. Nothing was what it seemed. We were free citizens, yet there were places in the city that we could not visit after sundown. The daily upheavals in my reality made the looking glass world seem not only logical, but somewhere I wish I could go for a vacation. I was sick with delusions and sweats. You know they've never left me. I was wrapped in my favorite blue rayon blanket. You had pulled it straight off the bed in your panic. Mama had given me a sponge bath and half and had half talked half forced me into my fresh hand-sewn white flannel jammies peppered with tiny blue and gold flowers. I was so sick I couldn't walk. You carried me through the darkness that night. How do I remember all of this? How could I forget? Memory is fluid and the, and the fever left its strange residue on my psyche. As I went in and out of consciousness, I listened to your voices, hear them still, you and Mama weighing our bleak circumstance. Despite the long hours and the hard work, Mama labored as a seamstress. You worked around the clock as a janitor nights, as a sign painter days, 
as diligent as diligently as you obeyed the maxim of early to bed, early to rise. You would never achieve wealth, and 33 years later, a brain tumor would deprive you of the remnants of your health and wisdom. You had no money and no medical insurance. What chance did you have to get the help I needed? Dr. Rayfield Lewis, one of the few Negro physicians who made house calls in our neighborhood, had sent you across town from his office to the charity hospital in Hollywood. And now I am listening through my fever to you and mama as you argue with the cold of fish's blonde admissions nurse. I can see her, Pop. I can see her immaculate starched white collar and uniform, her fine knit gray blue sweater, and I can see her helper, the auburn haired candy stripper who keeps sticking the glass thermometer in my mouth. Temperature of 104 degrees. I can see their crisp white cap. Yet, there are no angels of mercy here. Mama doesn't know I'm awake. She thinks I'm sleeping. She cries as she begs for them to let me see a doctor. Her husband whimpers, say that I will die without emergency treatment. You stand behind her, fists rammed into your pockets. But they don't treat poor colored children here. Not unless the referring physician has privileges. Not even for emergencies. I am refused admission. I can still hear the clack of Mama's thick leather heels against the linoleum as she rushes outside to bring the car around to the front. You wait with me. The security guard has been summoned to watch against potential violence. Everyone senses your rage. You are a big man, an ex-boxer, your thick honey brown arms bulge beneath your worn brown woolen sports jacket the one you wore home from the shop that evening, the one that makes me itch. The blanket prevents me from coming in contact with it. Once, when my cheek brushes your shoulder, I feel the bite and the sting of the wool. How the guard stares at us, I wonder what he sees. He knows you were once some kind of athlete and is impressed by your size. I could see his badge and his gun. There's the distance honking of the car. You're tired. Your shoulders slump suddenly. You take a deep, long breath, and before you bend over to lift me, you look the white security guard in the eyes and say, be a man, be decent. My child is dying. Your words shock him. He holds the double doors open for you. You've shamed him into cooperating. You cradle me in your arms with a grunt. I weigh a hundred pounds. I can hear the scrape of your shoe leather as you carry me outside into the dark morning and down the concrete stairs. I look for the moon, but can't find it. The old sedan is there. Mama behind the steering wheel. She leaves the motor running, jumps out, and opens the door. You lay me in the back, then take the driver's seat. County General is 10 minutes away by Mama's count. But you must be careful not to speed. We can't afford to be stopped by the police. Your prayers for my recovery, Jesus, help me, Father, are answered within two weeks. I receive the treatment needed, undergo the spinal taps, the electroencephalograms, the drugs. I live, and now I'm telling about it. In some strange way, that night, our night, was the most significant of my childhood spent fighting allergies and illnesses. Yet, it is only now, some 40 years later, that I've come to recognize this as fact, to examine it, to ask myself why, to grapple for the answer which still eludes me at this writing. My blues love affair. Oh, blues gonna get me, oh, blues gonna get me high. I grew up in the Southern California of the late 1940s through 50s, listening primarily to country and Western, gospel and popular music. My mother's relationship to my father, ethnically speaking, was ambivalent, though they both identified as colored. She did not seem to understand or care for the race music of the day made by black folk or the attendant fashions. I recall one incident where father brought home a gift for himself, new duds in a large, pretty department store box. He folded back the tissues and lifted out a zoot suit. He even had the wide brim hat and a pair of those exaggerated nines or kick shoes. 
Mother told him in choice, icy terms, that she wouldn't be seen with him on the streets in that silly get-up. He closed the box and took the threads back to the store. Her ears were as critical as her eyes when it came to his record collection. Pop sounds around our household were diverse as Hoagie Carmichael, Stardust, Fats Domino, Honey Child, Peggy Lee, Manyama, and Liberus, Liberace, September Song. Al Jarvis's make-believe ballroom on KFWB was one of my mother's radio favorites.